Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 15th Annual Bio CEO and Investor Conference. I'm Celia Economides, Director of Investor Relations and Programs at Bio. It's my pleasure to introduce the next session, Small Companies Thinking Big, China Tactical Strategies. This is actually a session we did at our second annual BioChina Conference um, at the end of 2012. It did so exceedingly well that we decided we'd have a, re a little bit of a repeat performance here this year at Bio CEO. It's my pleasure to introduce the moderator, who is Jimmy Zhang. He's the Managing Director at MSD Early Investments for Greater China Merck & Co. Um, before joining Merck, Jimmy was a Senior Vice President at Synergenics, a professional service and venture firm founded and led by Dr. Bill Rutter, one of the founding fathers and pioneers of the biotech industry. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Jimmy. Thanks, Cecilia. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I would like to thank the bio organizers again uh, for the invitation for this repeat to present this panel, uh, Small Company Thinking Big, uh, China Tactic Strategies. Uh, we have a very experienced panel here, and I would like to uh, ask each panelist to give a one minute self-introduction first. Let's start from Lawrence. Thank you, Jimmy. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Lawrence Reed. I'm the Chief Business Officer at Al Nalem Pharmaceuticals in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, Al Nilem is a company based on RNA interference technologies, and I've been the Chief Business Officer there, officer there for the past uh, uh, almost three years now. Prior to that, I was at a company called Ensemble Therapeutics, which is a small chemistry-based technology company in, in Cambridge. And I started, I did 10 plus years at Millennium, various business development, and uh, I was also general manager of their operations in Europe. Good to be here. Um, I'm uh, Kieran Jin. I'm a China-based uh, entrepreneur. Uh, I've been uh, uh, doing startup companies in the biotech and CL space in China for the last uh, 12, 13 years. Uh, New York City, actually, I, I spent 80 years in New York in the late 80s to early 90s in graduate school and, and business school, so it's kind of a, uh, going home. Uh, and uh, what other things? Uh, since my last exit, uh, the last 18 months, I've been kind of, other than goofing around and finding leisure is overrated, uh, I've been learning about a few new business area like a, a device and healthcare service, but still my heart is in the uh, drug-related uh, uh, industry. Yeah. My name is Friedhelm Blobel. I'm the CEO of Cyclone Pharmaceuticals. Cyclone started in China in 1996. Uh, I joined the company in 2006, and uh, today we do about $150 million in the, uh, revenues and have about 800 people on the ground, all focused on marketing and selling. I'm Alan Eisenberg, I'm Executive Vice President with Bio. I'm responsible for our emerging companies, our pre market, early stage commercial companies, and for the last uh, five or six years, I've been leading our efforts to get to know the Chinese life sciences space, and have been spending quite a bit of time in China with, and uh, also providing some guidance to some of our large and small companies as they set up operations in China. Thanks. Uh, again, I'm Jimmy Zhang. As Cecilia said, I'm uh, with Merck and responsible for Merck's uh, licensing acquisition and uh, external research collaboration in Greater China, and also uh, the new Merck Research Venture Fund uh, in China. Uh, before, China, before joining Merck, I was uh, with Bill Rudder, um, making investment and operating some of the portfolio companies in San Francisco. Some of the portfolio companies had entered China, uh, established manufacturing and marketing and sales in China, and had been doing quite well in China. And some portfolio companies were in the process of entering China. So at that time, I traveled between US and China quite often, about eight to 10 trips per year. Uh, I didn't think it was sustainable, so I was thinking big, and what I should be my China strategy. So about 10, 11 months ago, I did an M&A deal for myself, and I was acquired by Merck as a single asset, and I joined <laughs> Merck. So here I am, uh, jumping from a, a group of small uh, biotech companies uh, to a big company uh, over 80,000 people and are now located in Beijing. So I just uh, give a very brief um, uh, presentation on China market and to set the stage for uh, our uh, panel discussion. Uh, China 
has been growing really, really fast. Uh, last year it had become the third largest pharmaceutical uh, market in the world. And by IMS estimate, by 2020, it will become the second largest uh, right behind US market. Most of the drug in China right now is still the generics, uh, but the Western prescription drug, so-called <coughs> innovative drug, are increasing much, much faster than the generic drug uh, in China. The VC investment in life sciences has been growing in the last several years, especially you see the spike uh, in 2010, and then the drop of 2011, and the 2012 remain about the same. But the average investment per, uh, the average investment per in, uh, amount per investment uh, keep going up. Uh, most of the investment are in the healthcare services and the CRO business. Very few are in innovative drug uh, discovery and development. Chinese government have been supporting the life sciences and biotech uh, recently. In the, uh, China still a kind of uh, a blender of the marketing, uh, market economy and uh, the planning economy. So they have this 12th year, five year plan uh, to decide what the country will do in the next five years. Uh, biotech is one of the seven uh, street emerging strategic industry and the government has put a lot of support uh, into the biotech in, uh, investment. So I just flash through this. Uh, you will see uh, the, all these policies and the regulations uh, to support uh, the biotech industry and try to attract uh, more biotech talent uh, into China. Uh, you might have heard of this uh, 10,000 talent uh, uh, a program uh, try to attract uh, the returnees, the overseas Chinese students return to China. Uh, so here you see uh, some of these numbers. Uh, we call them the sea turtles. And uh, Kevin is one of the earliest sea turtles returning to China uh, in 1990s. And I'm one of the latest uh, return uh, to China. So, uh, let me see whether I can go back to the, uh, oh, how do I go back to the one slide? Okay, here it is. Uh, we'll just start with uh, some of uh, the questions and then we will open the floor uh, to the audience. So China is a very attractive market but it's also full of potential risk, especially for those foreign companies that are not very familiar uh, with China. Unlike large multinational companies who have a lot of resources, smaller companies do not have such luxury. Uh, Freeham, uh, could you talk about Cyclone's decision process to enter China? What challenge have you en encountered when entering China? Thank you, Jimmy. Uh, thinking about China, I think for Western companies, it is really crucial first to think about what role in China, role of China do you think about, what do you see, what China can do particularly well. In our case, that led to marketing and selling, and as I mentioned in the brief introduction, we are in the Chinese market for a very long time, already since uh, the mid-90s. But uh, when you think about selling your drug, you certainly should be aware that uh, China is, on the one side, a very attractive market. It is already a large market. About 300 million uh, people in China are covered by what is today considered uh, China healthcare. And uh, that leaves a lot of room, another billion uh, of people uh, who will enter this market, maybe not all of the billion, but certainly several hundred more million will enter in the next five to ten years. So you certainly should think about the China market uh, as a very attractive uh, sales opportunity for your drugs. Now, that's uh, very nice and very attractive, but you also should be aware that uh, getting drugs approved in China is a slow process and a rather unpredictable process. Uh, as a kind of um, rule of thumb, 
a product already approved in a Western market will take three to five years to get through the SFDA, the complement to the Washington FDA uh, for China. And thereafter, you're not yet quite there to start marketing and selling because for the commercial process which then starts, uh, you need to get a national price. Then you need to get on the tenders of every single of the 30 provinces. And once you are on a tender, you need to do a listing by hospital. Only after your drug is listed in a hospital are you allowed to start selling. So put this all together, the commercial process takes another one year for the early ones, but more two years before you're rather widely available in the country. So adding those two which are sequential up is five to seven years for a drug which is already on the Western market. So you need to have staying power and you need to have patience. And uh, for most companies, if they are not big MNCs who certainly have their own organization, you need to think about with whom to partner. Because if you have one, two or three drugs, it's typically too cumbersome and too difficult to go all the way by yourself and bring the, mar the product to the market yourself. That's where the role comes in which our company can play, other companies similar to ours can play, and obviously for very big and attractive drugs, also the big multinationals like Merck, AstraZeneca or you name it, are interested to in-license uh, these drugs. But I think that's for most of the companies, particular mid-sized and smaller companies, is really to think about who would be the right partner to bring these products to the Chinese market and then really rely on such a partnership uh, to bring your product to the market and successfully market it. Uh, just a little comment, since uh, uh, Freeham talked about the uh, SFDA approval process. Uh, so that's for the product that has been already on the US and the European market, but what about those products that are still in the clinical trials? Like, for example, phase one, phase two, what would be right. the strategy? Uh, I think the probably most straightforward approach is if uh, you try to partner at the end of phase two and do then a multinational trial where you have, uh, in addition to the trial which you run for your Western approvals, the US and EMEA typically, uh, that you add a couple of sites in China which will then allow, once you successfully complete the phase three, to apply also for drug approval in China about at the same time when you do this in the Western world. Right, and by doing that way as a multi-center uh, multi trial, you're probably going to save like two or three years. Correct. Yeah, but still you have to go through the pricing and tender after it's approved. Oh yes, that's this commercialization process is the same and you better are on the ground. You practically cannot, if you try to start uh, getting on the tenders and do the hospital listing coming from ground zero. I think it's practically impossible and you will, quotation mark, waste the potential of your drug if you try to do it alone. You need to partner one way or the other in order to do this successfully. Right. And I mean there are some very specific cases where it's difficult or too expensive to do certain development uh, outside or in the, in the Western world where one can consider to really start even earlier in China, but that's getting very tricky because the SFDA actually doesn't like foreign companies to do phase one trials, and uh, that becomes really complicated if you consider something like that. Right, and you might have heard of uh, most recently AstraZeneca, Wuxi Pharma tech deal on their, uh, one of their biologics. So they use Wuxi Pharma tech as a local Chinese company uh, to go through the clinical trials, the rectory and manufacturing. That actually will save quite some time to get the product uh, move forward into uh, the commercial. Uh, Alan, you've also represented bio and led several US biotech dedications to China and meet with many local Chinese companies. What's your impression and the strategy and, uh, and the process? So, like 
Ms. Friedhelm said, my impression having, uh, I wasn't on the plane quite as much as you, but I think 15 or so trips over the last three years is, is enough. Um, it, there are a couple of things that stand out. One is what Freedom said is exactly right, which is first said it's complicated. It's very complicated, especially for smaller companies and even mid-sized companies to be established if you have a product you want to bring to market. Um, even if you're able to get a registrational trial done, it still is very difficult to begin the sales and marketing operations. So who's going to be partnering with how you partner, how you set up. Most of us companies are not going to want to establish a commercial operation in China um, because of the complexity and also because of the marketing operations. You get into a whole variety of questions that are very important relating to FCPA and how things get things get sold at, at the very at the hospital level, at the distributor level. Um, but for besides the fact that it's complicated, you also see this enormous world of opportunity in terms of um, the, the fact that, that the while well, the SFDA is, is complicated and, and tricky and sometimes takes a while to clear INDs, right now it is looking very seriously at and, and there is right now operation of uh, a pathway to get drugs through more quickly. And that there is right now uh, a lot of proposals to expand uh, drugs that are on the essential drug list. So that reimbursement will begin to be uh, much more possible. And especially in some of, on some of the coastal areas that it will be more possible to have uh, uh, innovative medicines be reimbursed. Um, that there are for US companies great possibilities for access to capital in terms of out licensing. The amount of in licensing that's gone on over the course of the last couple of years has expanded dramatically and we think that trend will continue. The companies in China that have been, uh, are right now, many of them are learning how to do development. And they're learning how to do development by in licensing <coughs> product from the West and uh, proceeding through. The, uh, as you pointed out in your slides, this is one of the seven targeted industries in the five-year plan. The government is putting a lot of resources into, and on, on a lot is a lot. We're talking billions, tens of billions of dollars. Many of it is going through the Ministry of Science and Technology out to, um, to companies, Chinese companies, to help expand R&D facilities, plant property and equipment, but to learn how to do development by their, by, in licensing drugs. And so therefore it's serving as a, as a source of capital for many smaller US companies that are out, that are out licensing product. So, and, and what's, and then the last thing I think I'll, I'll just stop after this is um, a, a, a slide that you skipped through, but I think it's, it's, it's very important is um, the role of returnees. There are people who have spent a decade or more in the U.S. working for pharma companies um, who are on the ground, who are either working for U.S. pharmacos, working for Chinese companies, or have founded their own companies on the ground who are building an industry there. And they have seen both the good and bad and ugly of how we do drug development and discovery and are, are changing model, the model up there. And so I see there's a, a tremendous opportunity. It's fraught with risk, but I see a tremendous opportunity for small uh, and mid-sized U.S. companies. And so you know, we, we counsel and engage with our companies that are looking at it um, on, a, on a variety of fronts. Right. So uh, two uh, things uh, Alan mentioned. One is the FCPA. So, FC, uh, so China is kind of like a government-run uh, country. Uh, so the, all the professors, all the physicians uh, are considered as a government official. So when large, small, mid-sized company deal with the Chinese professors or physicians, we got to be very careful. These are considered on the FCPA. FCPA as, uh, is Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Yeah. Just yeah. for people who have not dealt with selling overseas. It, it concerns how you pay government officials. Uh, and it's intended, of course, to deter bribe making and so forth, but just FCPA concerns are things that any company that wants to get on the ground there uh, needs to be aware of. Certainly your general counsels would need to be aware of. Sorry. Okay, if, 
well, no, I don't, FCPA is a kind of a tar baby. It's no, no way, right way to touch it. Um, yeah, um, I, let, yeah, I think uh, your, your slide mentioned about uh, return, quote unquote, the uh, returnees, these are people, they came to United States in the 80s and 90s for graduate school and then move into industry, kind of learn the trade. And, and the timing for the emergence of the Chinese uh, life science industry is very good. The way that I see it is uh, it just happened when China is ready for a kind of research-based uh, life science industry. It just happens there are 50,000 Chinese mid-level scientists and managers in New Jersey and California hit midlife crisis. And <laughs> they, get, you know, they, they can see where they are going to be all the way to retirement, and it's not exciting. And on the other side of the Pacific, they, at least they perceive seems to be all these uh, 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 potential possibilities. Not all of this are true. And going back, I think for most of the uh, CEOs of small to medium size uh, uh, US biotech company, uh, China is tantalizing but frustrating for you. Your board, some of your VC board members say, gee, we, should, we, we need to have a China strategy. But China is very user unfriendly. Uh, there's a lot of noise level out there. Uh, I'm sure every biotech company you would have some Chinese employees, uh, Chinese scientists, or VP of this and VP of that. Uh, they will come out of uh, one university in China, or, and they will usually try to direct you to their alma mater, their cousins, or, or one of their high school classmates now is the vice mayor of something. Yes, uh, you know, they say, okay, you should definitely let me lead the China initiative. And then the thing is there's uh, a gazillion advisors, uh, consultants. Uh, a lot of them are pretty good, but not all of them. Uh, if you've been traveling to Beijing, uh, I would say half of the taxi driver in Beijing say they know somebody in the Politburo. Uh, and some of them probably do. So my video is the, the tw top 20 people who are running the country. Yeah. So, but I, but I think, uh, you know, uh, 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 Friedhelm was talking about uh, a very long process. Gets to do commercialization, have your own sales force out there. Uh, basically, um, doing all the heavy lifting. I think for most of you guys, it's not, don't even think about it. It's just too long takes too hard, and you don't have the bandwidth to do that. And because necessarily, most of your energy, time, and most of your money needs to be focused on US market, and maybe for you know, European, your based company in Europe. That's where you're, you're gonna make or break your company. But what I think China offers is, uh, I always try to position, when I go talk to US uh, about that company CEOs, I say, how about you get something for you know, not doing anything? Uh, basically, can you find some Chinese partners or entities that basically have them fund all the activities and, and do most of the work and, and then share some of the upside uh, for you? And, and I think there is a very rich spectrum of different kind of deal structures being tried out uh, with large Chinese companies, with Chinese startups, or with kind of anywhere in between. The anywhere from risk sharing to out licensing or for those companies who can afford the money and time to build up your own China company, which is probably not an option for a lot of you. Uh, so I think the possibility is out there, and it's really worthwhile to explore. Uh, and and uh, we can go into the more of the, right. the, the, the possible framework you can do that. Yeah, so Kevin, you, you mentioned uh, a Chinese partner uh, stationed in China and tried to work West, with Western companies. So is that our licensing or uh, collaboration? So the IP risk. So IP leaks have been one of the biggest concerns even for larger multinationals. Uh, China had bad reputations. 10, 15 years ago, uh, we have heard a lot of those horrible stories about IP leaks and infringement in China. When a foreign company started R&D in China, some employee 
will steal the trade secrets and sell that trade secret to others, even for a very small amount of money. Or when a foreign company start manufacturing in China, the supplier or the plant manager's relative uh, will pop out a similar factory right next to it and steal your customer. So what's the situation now? And Lawrence, you did an outlicensing deal uh, with uh, Asclidus, a Chinese company, last year. So what was your concern at the time, and why did you select the company, and what kind of measure did you put there to protect your interests and your IP? Okay. Um, let me take those in, in reverse order, if, if I may. So Asclidus is a, is a private, uh, private Chinese company. It actually essentially has a foot in both the U.S. Uh, and in China, and it was started. Um, it was funny you talk about yeah, sort of the, in the, the small world. But it was started by um, an ex uh, senior researcher from from Glaxo, and his high school buddy had made uh, <laughs> um, a lot of money in the construction industry and was looking to move um, money and invest in a different area. And that's how that that company is is financed. But it has some um, very reputable people um, out of Glaxo and other major pharmaceutical companies who are involved both. Western-based and, and Westerners, as well as some returnees, um, and then the CEO, who's actually a Chinese national and spends about 50% of his time in in America and, and the rest in China itself. And um, you know, Al Nilam historically had done a lot of work in in Japan, including we have a major relationship with Takeda, which is an ongoing relationship but had an exclusivity provision to it in Asia that that effectively expires uh, very soon. So we'd started to think about about China and um, had a couple of, I think, very successful trips there. Um, we found it relatively easy to get to meet people. I mean, by sort of serious networking, we, but we didn't, we didn't use a consultant. And we can talk more about that if that's useful to people. Um, we met Asclidus relatively early, early on in that process. Turns out that we have some personal connections there, as is so often the way. Um, they were looking for cancer-based assets primarily and infectious disease agents secondarily to build a um, to begin to build a pipeline um, of proprietary products in China. And we had a cancer program involved in um, uh, liver cancers, which where the next step medically was, was clearly to do a trial in hepatocellular carcinoma. And as many of you are probably aware, um, that's a, you know, the, the Chinese population with that condition is the largest um, population of that kind, uh, disease population of that kind in, in the world. It's a major problem derivative from the, from the hepatitis problem. So it, there was a sort of scientific overlap that fitted with our strategy, and we've essentially used that asset, and we struck a collaboration and out license just in China and Taiwan with Asclidus. Um, they're going to take the, the program forward, so they're dealing locally with all the SFDA issues that my colleagues on the left have, have just been talking about. And our, and our understanding is that that's sort of the slow piece, is, is beginning to get established, build that relationship around a, a, a product from, a, from a, another part of the world brought into China that that initial transition with the SFDA has been, has been critical and they, they have that local presence and local expertise. Um, and then they'll drive that program through, through clinical trials. Al Nilam will get a royalty when they sell it, but equally importantly, we're going to have access to the data um, with a view to developing that product ourselves uh, in the Western world. Um, in terms of the IP, it's, it's a fairly standard um, type of out license. I think the, the, the biggest sensitivity in, in our world is a lot of the basic patents around um, sRNA, synthesis, design, um, even manufacture are, you know, have, been, have been published for some while now. Um, but some of the most sort of sensitive information really relates to um, some of the formulation and process chemistry types of, uh, types of steps. We, we've been enabling a Asclidus in that area um, and one of the things that we inevitably got into was was whether they were going to do it themselves or whether they were going to whether they were going to outsource the manufacture and the relationship we have with them for the, for the foreseeable future is they're going to do the manufacturing themselves. Our impression is that with a lot of the returnees, that the attitude towards IP, and I'm not saying it's just because of the returnees, but I think the, the returnees it's easier for them to um, make that association with the importance of IP. So we found Asclidus and other companies to be very sensitized to that and to be very sensitized to the Western world's perception of the challenge in China. So we had some very engaged, I would say, constructive discussions with them on that front. They're manufacturing the product themselves, at least through, um, at least through uh, Chinese NDA. And 
that doesn't solve the problem in and of itself of, of you know rogue employees or whatever, but at least it kept it very close to home in terms of, of people who worked directly with the people that we built a relationship with, and so that was that was a key piece of for us of, of getting more comfortable with that, and I think we have to see a little bit in, in terms of you know where that plays out in years to come. That, that's good. So so that's one type of. Uh, uh, interaction that's kind of like a JV, and uh, and also the CRO business in China is quite popular now. Uh, Kevin actually helped start Camp Partner, one of the er earliest CRO in China, and was the China GM for Charles River. So yeah, can, can um, you talk about? Yeah, I, the way I see it, the research-based China life industry is a trilogy or if symphony of three move, movement. Movement one started around 2001 when Wuxi got started, came part, we started in 2002. That's done. Uh, when, when it's seven, eight years ago, people like us went to talk to VP of Kim Street, some pharma companies, they were very polite to us, but they must be laughing that, you know, what are you thinking that, the, you know, the mighty Merck or Pfizer that would do Medcan in China. Now it's kind of a taken for granted that you can do that. So that's done. Uh, the chapter two, I think, is to how to leverage early innovation from the West. And I think it's, uh, there is a lot of uh, early uh, innovation that either in drug or in medical device, diagnostic kind of gets stuck in the early preclinical or late, no, late preclinical and early clinical development that need money and need cost effective, high quality on the, uh, to kind of uh, move it further along. And I, that's, I think, the most interesting uh, that business model for the next four, five, six, seven, eight years. And then probably chapter three beyond that is de novo innovation coming out of China on the broader base. Uh, right now, there are a few isolate pocket of excellence, uh, but mostly, I would say, you, your, your chance of getting something cutting edge science is much better here or in Boston or, or, or you know, somewhere in the UAE. So, so I think you're gonna see a lot of deals and CIO, I think you're, uh, the early stage of explosive growth, you know, we're talking about doubling headcount every year, uh, uh, that's gone, that's done. So you are gonna see uh, several, uh, a lot of consolidations. So it's, it's not a good time to start new CLs. <laughs> it's time to either consolidate or buy somebody or cash out. But it, it build the essential infrastructure. Because I would say seven, eight years ago, if you want to get into the NCE business in China, you have to pretty much do everything yourself. It's like, you know, you open a restaurant, you have to grow your own vegetable or milk your own cows and, and stuff like that. Now, uh, everything, I would say a lot of, most of the stuff can be outsourced and is there in the right, in, right there in the neighborhood. And they've been taking through the learning curve by the most demanding clients like, you know, again, like <laughs> Merck or Lilly or Pfizer. So they have learned their trade. So, so I would think in the next stage, the really exciting thing will be from the US side, obviously looking for Chinese partners, but for, for Chinese companies, uh, try to identify uh, partners, big or small, from here to form some kind of a partnership. And there is a very uh, different, a lot of different models being being tried out from all the way from straight out licensing on one hand. It's, it's very interesting. I have, you know, on this side, uh, build a wholly owned China company. You pay for everything, you do everything, you own and control everything, but it's hard. On the other hand, find a trustworthy Chinese partner, probably somebody you used to work with uh, here in the U.S. a long time. Now he's doing a company uh, back in China. And let, let them do all the heavy lifting. But on the other hand, then obviously, necessarily, you need to have them capture a lot of the upside. So somewhere in between uh, really depends on what's your comfort zone. And again, what's your judgment, how much time you, you can afford to spend on this. Yeah. Right, let's just uh, focus this, uh, on this a little bit. Uh, you have the China strategy, you decide how to enter China, try to find, find a partner. So how do you exactly do it? You fly in 
or you have somebody on the ground, how, or you hire a consultant, what would be the best way? <laughs> well, I mean, it's very hard if you want to do it uh, with remote control or in a remote way. I mean, you need to make your feet wet and you need to get into the country. But uh, if you start really from ground zero, I mean, it's probably good to familiarize yourself with who are some of the players, what are they doing, uh, and, uh, and then really uh, go there and start talking to the people that you feel comfortable with the people. Because Started by going to Alan's conference. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> so I think you can't in the end do it theoretically. You need to really go there. And uh, I think what, uh, what Kevin said is absolutely correct. But you need to find somebody, you know, who you really can trust. And uh, yes, you need to leave them the room that they try what they think they can do. But don't be too surprised if uh, 80 of 100 different approaches fail or 80% of the approaches fail and you have a bigger chance to be among the 80 than about the 20. Mm -hmm. So if you feel you have a really great asset, and uh, you really would like to do something, I think if you want to reduce your risk and really get, uh, then you should go uh, maybe a little bit more a structured way or something which has been proven. Yeah. And uh, I think it, it, it really all depends, you know, how risk adverse or risk open are you with uh, and how big is the asset which you have. Yeah. So I, I would, um I think that's I think that's exactly right. I would I would say just you know if you're thinking about coming to China and you have an idea of I either would like to I'm preclinical and I'm interested in finding a, a partner on a fee for service basis or I'm interested in I've got a clinical asset and I'm interested in finding a development partner. All of those are viable and possible routes you could go. Um, uh, the the latter of those two you could. You know, try and set it up to, ra to raise capital and so forth on with the pretty standard sort of terms that you have. Mm. The the, um, but I guess in terms of developing uh, relationships, I guess my and and trying to do what what Friedhelm said, I, I would sort of do uh, my advice would be uh, was some advice I got when uh, we were thinking about building a house, which was to find and set your budget, but then double it. Um, because it, it's, it's a lot of money. And I mean that both in terms of money and in terms of time. It takes time to go over and build relationships if you want to do it right. There's, I think, a, a lot of opportunity, but it requires face time. It requires relationship building. The, culturally, there's a high value. It's much less, less transactional from, from, you know, from a societal standpoint than, than I think we are. I think it requires you to actually put in time and get to know who your partner is going to be and engage with them properly. Um, and it takes time because it, it's, it's not quick or easy to get there, and so it takes time to go, and it takes time to travel and, and go, whether you're in Shanghai, whether you're in Beijing. Um, the, but, and a conference like ours is certainly one of the places you can go where you can access a lot of uh, I'll take the free pitch, but it's, I think it's something like that you should do because you've got to find a way to leverage uh, and, and use, use the leverage. We, so I agree with everything that was just said. I mean, we, we certainly um, had multiple trips over there to establish our relationship with the Scletus. You know, I went, um, somebody who works in my team and who led the deal went, our president went. Uh, we, we found it relatively easy to, to go. It's a long way. But, but I, we found people very willing to meet. We, we worked hard on introductions, but the, but the sort of networking element of it in terms of getting the right introductions felt not so dissimilar to doing business development in the, in the Western world. And um, so we spent a lot of time in advance networking our way in through, through our friends in the venture industry, through people we knew at banks, through you know, friends of friends within large pharmaceutical companies. And, um, 
uh, and then there's also this sort of fluidity to um, how people there manage their time, which is just culturally a little bit different in terms oh, of yes. there's, a, there's, a, there's an informality <laughs> which when you're traveling 12,000 miles, 15,000 miles, it, it leaves you a little bit on the edge of like, you know, <laughs> the people are going to be there. And it's, we wouldn't hesitate to call you on weekends and evenings. Sure, no, which, <laughs> and all, all, all of which is fine. It, it, it's also, in Shanghai is a, a very, very big city as well. Um, but, uh, but we found it... We, we, so we had to, you have to sweat at it. We had to, we worked pretty hard to, to explore a lot of different angles to, to find the right yeah. partner and to find the yeah. right deal. One, yeah. But, um, but we found it, but I found it relatively straightforward in terms of getting the traction. And I agree with Alan that people weren't quite as transactional as some of us in the Western world yeah. are, but I found the meetings had an informality that I, f I found familiar with how we, how we do business here on a, on, a, on a regular basis and they moved pretty quickly to well we could do this and we could do that and it was different to I, I think other, other cultures where I think there's, a, there's a, a slower build to the ability to, to get close to a transaction. One thing for someone who came to US in the 80s uh, and now live, been living in China for the last 14 years, uh, this contrast in mood uh, the previous panel obviously have enormous experience among the four or five of them. But I feel a little bit depressed at the end of the session, basically. It was like try to salvage, you know, the tremendous of the amount of the money being poured into this industry. Let's try to pick throw the what's left of it to try to make some money from that. Uh, and maybe it's naivety. We are uh, in China, the industry is in the early stage of getting started. So there's this kind of a general optimism or can do, uh, you know, we'll make it work one way or the other. People will find a way and uh, to try to find the money. And, and it was what US used to be that when I came here as a graduate student. And so it was funny that I was at the conference in Stanford. I was telling people, I say, American dream is alive in China. <laughs> <laughs> How did that go down? <laughs> they don't like it. Yeah, you went into the, the heart of American entrepreneurialism and told them their dream was dead. Huh. And actually, now in China, making money is not a shame anymore. Oh, are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, Lawrence talked talk about the culture difference between doing business in the U.S. and in China. <laughs> and, and actually, I'm glad you worked with uh, a returnee who was educated here yeah. and uh, worked here before. But with local Chinese company, uh, relationship building is very, very important. Mm. So don't talk about any transaction probably in the first six months. So you have to do dining and wine, and it get drunk, and it, sometimes you have to go to karaoke before you can talk about business. So it's a lot more like in Japan, you get uh, build up the relationship. Yeah, I, I agree with most of what you said. I agree with the drinking bit. Um, <laughs> I, I, I found maybe the companies that we met with that were, had significant um, portions of returnees, and I found it very natural first date or at least dinner after a first date to be talking about in a non-committal kind of way about what well, we could do this or we could we could do this I found it mm, yeah. people very but I think engaged. there's there's really a difference and it might be even a gliding scale the earlier you go in terms of development the more you find companies started by returnees who really understand the US speak the language yeah. know all the biotech lingo but the more you get commercial the more you get Chinese. And these are established companies who have built the companies in a Chinese way the last 10 years. And uh, I mean, if you go to the distributors, that's about then the extreme you can get to. Mm, these are the bandits. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I think there was uh, uh, you know, a lot of uh, uh, senior exec from different companies passing through time in Shanghai. And usually, they are the one who kind of uh, chaperones them around China is my friend. They say, can you have? dinner, lunch, breakfast with them. I, I always ask, can we do it at the end of your China trip rather than at the beginning of your China trip? So they, they know who they're dealing with. So it's kind of a, on one end uh, of the spectrum again, so the big state-owned enterprise, you know, the, uh, the Sino farm, the Beijing farm, they are humongous company. And quite a, a few of them sits on billions of dollars of cash. Uh, they just went IPO. Or just get a, a you know, Sinopharm just right. got what three and a half billion U.S. dollars from the China Development Bank. 
But on the other hand, the communication gap between you, it's like you are speaking French, they are speaking Russian. Uh, you kind of talking across each other. Yes, it's, it's hard. On the other hand, there are this startup company in Zhangjiang or, or, or Beijing, they totally speak your language, but they don't have any money. So why, why so, <laughs> so it's, it's kind of, the, but then in between there are some company that does talk your language and have some money. But I think things are gonna get better because uh, uh, it is real, for real. At the beginning when China was talking about uh, we need to move from made in China to invented in China, I was thinking this is just lip service. Uh, you know, there was seen this before, it's just going to be throwing a lot of money at the white elephant science project, you know, and not, not uh, you know, there was, uh, uh, and basically some uh, older, uh, science uh, uh, warlords, I call them, uh, these like academy of members in China was trying to fund their pet project. But, but now, I think it's uh, getting a little bit smarter and uh, something I, I do feel going down, uh, you're gonna see Chinese companies actually are serious looking for compounds for some kind of a NCE right. uh, uh, ability to, to do development. So, so I just ask a question. Yes, please. What about women? Oh, oh, you, you go oh uh, when you look at it, uh, one of the most successful innovative com biotech company in China was funded and led by women. Mm. Samantha Du. Uh, Hutchison uh, Biopharma. Well, that's just one. Yeah. Uh, well, and I mean, the in, the, in the industry, the sales reps, they are majority of women. Uh, in the sales organization, the, the channel managers of the business units, in our case, they're all women. Mm -hmm. So and that's lower down the sort of hierarchy, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, I'll give you the uh, other example. Uh, Lee uh, now is 2.0 who sold their product, uh, license, well, sold their company to Biomarine was also led by a woman called Sophie Chow. Yeah, I, you know, I've been back for quite many years. Uh, um, certainly you do see a lot more men in the senior exact position, uh, but so is here, right? Uh, and uh, I think actually in this case, from what my limited understanding of industry like Japan, Chinese actually are a lot, probably more open to having women in the senior position. Uh, and, and they are very talented, brilliant, aggressive, actually a lot of them US trained, uh, uh, female entrepreneur and, and senior execs in the industry. I think uh, you, that would not be a problem at all. Uh, and you can't compare it with Japan. Japan, I mean, the women, the role of women in, in business is probably 20 years away from what it is in the US. Mm -hmm. But in China, I mean, they may be more advanced than the US yeah. in terms of uh, the, the possibilities for women. Yeah, and also you see a lot of, uh, quite a few of the, the you know, VC partners, law firm partners, uh, and uh, in China's uh, uh, females. Yeah, and uh, when you look at the multinational in China, uh, Bayer Healthcare uh, R&D um, Center were run Roche, by a woman. Roche, Roche were yeah. run by a woman. So yeah. uh, actually, I, I would say, yeah, it's a better yeah. environment for, yeah. for women to advance yeah. uh, in China. Yeah. So learn Mandarin and go there. Yeah, yeah I think that's a... <laughs> yeah, it does help if you like the food. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you don't ask what you're eating. <laughs> Yes. So, I'm with Neurostem. We're about to start a cell therapy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You're one of the Christopher West company? No. No, no. Oh, no. it's the other one. Okay. Yes. Yes. Is that we would get 
Yeah. Cell therapy is a particularly fuzzy field as of today. I, as you know, there is really no regulatory framework in place. But on the other hand, there is probably hundreds of hospitals doing it in different ways. So if you get four answer out of a four place, it's probably expected. Uh, and they may not know. And what's correct today could be shut down tomorrow because the whole cell therapy area is uh, is a yeah. Actually, SFDA just shut down all the stem cell therapy uh, in China. So there are just hundreds of hospitals doing so-called stem cell therapy yeah. without any approval. Yeah. Uh, well, wow. still on the, uh, when you have new drug, it's still on the, or new therapy. Okay, cell therapy is different because the military has, they can approve their own product within their hospitals. Say the army has their 150 hospitals. And the general logistic department of the PLA, they have their little, but they cannot sell into the general market. So for cell therapy, of course, they can recruit non-military patients. So that's a very special thing. You're really in the healthcare service business, not in the product business. Yeah. And we found it much more efficient. Yeah. Um, the good thing of working with a, um, I don't want to get myself into trouble. Anybody recording or something? You know, it's like uh, if you are marrying the daughter of a mafia don, uh, the pros and cons are all obvious. If your relationship is good, it's great. <laughs> if, if the relationship turns sore, you better leave town. I try not to do it. <laughs> Don't quote me, sorry. <laughs> your webcast. I was going to say it. Uh, any other question from the floor? Yes, please. Uh, to the panel, so we run a small company and I'm trying to look forward to the future. And I have a phase two or phase three program. Is now the time to partner in China? Should I wait? Uh, if, if it's right now, it's in the phase two, uh, actually, it's the time to search for the partner. Because once it's enter phase three, it can use China as one of the multi-centers, and then it do a global trial. Once you get approval from the US, then China will approve it right away. So it will save you about two or three years of time. If you wait until uh, phase three approval, then you have to do it as imported drug, and it start from probably phase one, but. Uh, abbreviated phase one, but it takes a long time. Yeah. See, so, the other thing is actually, uh, other than the big Chinese companies, the Chinese startup, there's a third uh, possible partner. is actually the China slash Asia company of the big multinationals. Uh, they actually, these days, are giving lots of leeways to do <coughs> regional deals. I mean, you, you see the Ironwood uh, AstraZeneca deal. Uh, uh, I, I don't know why AstraZeneca doesn't do it on a global basis, or maybe it's not available, but their global BD people maybe you know, said no to them, but they are the- It wasn't available. They'd, okay. they'd, they'd already been part okay. of almost okay. all the other major okay. markets. So every multinational company I know in these states has a dedicated regional BD guy uh, he serves the regional commercial head who's, you know, try to, to, uh, to add on to their uh, China slash Asia uh, <coughs> product. So, to, you, it's, and these are obviously the people who speak your language, you know, you, easier uh, uh, to do. So that's another possibility. I'd just say the, the, the advantage of, of coming in as a drug that's developed in China or, that, or thought about as developed in China as opposed to an imported drug I think is very important from an SFDA standpoint is you're dealing with the regulator. That's, that's a very, very helpful thing in terms of getting the product approved more quickly. Um, and especially if it's a product that happens to where there's a disproportionate sort of impact in, in as far as the Chinese population goes. That's something that is, uh, I think, 
the, the, the SFDA is particularly keen on, on looking at right now. Right, especially you are, if you are a manufacturer of vaccine or biologics, uh, SFDA prefer you to manufacture in China. Although they don't have a written rule say they will give a preference, but if you do have a manufacturer inside China, the approval process will be much faster. Uh, we probably have time for one more question from the floor. Okay. Okay, no more questions. So we uh, probably the panel can, each panelist give like a half minute to one minute take home message. Start from you, Alan. Okay. Uh, take home messages. Um, it's, it is, um, while there's risk, I think there's far more opportunity. The opportunities considerably outweigh risk. And so it takes some study, but it is, it is well worth engaging. There are opportunities both to get a product to market as well as to raise capital if you are a small company or if you're an investor that has a set of portfolio companies. It's, it's well worth taking a look at. As somebody has said, uh, it's really uh, worthwhile to spend the time and, uh, and go for the opportunity. And uh, yeah, you may have to give up uh, some of the upside, but still, it's, uh, it's a great opportunity and uh, it's worthwhile nowadays to think for every drug about uh, in which way can China help me. The worst that can happen is you have an interesting trip, so do it. <laughs> You will have an interesting trip, but I think the worst thing that can happen is you, you, can, you can sink a lot of time. I, I, think it's, I think it's really important. Somebody talks about, you know, you've got venture capitalists on your board, particularly as a private company running around, and half of them want a China strategy, and half of them don't want a China strategy. And I think you have to be pretty clear. And a lot of people were very crisp with, with me about this before we went in terms of, you have to be thinking carefully about what do you have to offer, um, and, and why are you doing this, and is there a real um, sort of nexus for what you have to offer? in the Chinese market that can redrive. Really Otherwise, I, I, I'm, I'm certain you could waste a huge amount of time splashing around if you don't have the right idea and the right uh, push. Right, right. and, and I'll, I will say just use Nike's uh, Just Do It, uh, but then uh, the devils are in the details and how you're going to do it. Uh, just don't fly in, helicopter in, helicopter out. Uh, that'll be very, very difficult. Find somebody on the ground, uh, some, like, like Cohen, the returnees yeah. who have spent a lot of time in the U.S. and also spend time in the U.S. company in China and also spend time with the Chinese company in China who speak the language uh, both English and Chinese and understand both cultures and, and then let them uh, trust them and uh, help them to uh, do it. And so in closing, thanks so much for all our panelists and thank you all for uh, staying uh, late uh, so uh, enjoy the cocktail in about half an hour. Thank you so much. Thank you.